One of the things that the Psalms reveals to us is the character and nature of God. And one of the confidences that we have is knowing that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so we can lean into who God is as he reveals himself in the Old Testament through the Psalms, because we can recognize the way that he continues to work, perhaps in the same ways in our lives today. I pray that today's episode is a blessing for you. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what he says in his word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach. And I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with him and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, before we get into today's episode, I have a quick word. I know that you have been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. I know, I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus, how he calls them, how he encourages them, how he equips them. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, helping you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I also include a lot of cultural and historical information that makes these familiar passages of scripture really come alive. This is a great study to do with maybe your teen girls or a group of friends from church, and it will really help you gain confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. Again, head to shehears.org and you can find the Bible study on the resources page. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we're continuing our devotional reading of the Psalms with Psalm 48, starting at verse 1. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise in the city of our God, his holy mountain. It is beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth. Like the utmost heights of Zaphon is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. God is in her citadels. He has shown himself to be her fortress. When the kings joined forces, when they advanced together, they saw her and were astounded. They fled in terror. Trembling seized them there, pain like that of a woman in labor. You destroyed them like ships of Tarshish, shattered by an east wind. As we have heard, so we have seen, in the city of the Lord Almighty, in the city of our God, God makes her secure forever." Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Mount Zion rejoices. The villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Count her towers. Consider well her ramparts. View her citadels, that you may tell of them to the next generation. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. So today, as we look at Psalm 48, this is a psalm that is considered a hymn. It's a psalm that was written by the sons of Korah, which we've talked about in previous episodes. But there's a uniqueness about Psalm 48 that I think is really helpful for us to understand the the context in which it was written. Psalm 48 is written as a response to the other kinds of hymns that were written in ancient Mesopotamia. So there would have been in that culture, in that time frame, hymns that were written to different holy cities. And so from a, from some of the earliest records that we have on ancient Mesopotamia, what we see in the records is that there were certain cities that were associated with different almost like a patron deity or God. And that patron God would be the protector of that city. And so the hymns were written 
to this holy city, but in association with this certain deity. And that was different depending on, you know, what, what region you were in. Um, there's a lot of famous law collections around Hammurabi. And that was like around 1750 BC. That is an example of that. And Hammurabi, he, he was one that built up various cities and temples to the different deities who dwelt in those different cities. And so there was this close association between cities and deities. And there was almost, um, like this, this silent understanding, I guess it wasn't silent. There was an understood association where even the city seal would incorporate the name of whatever that patron deity was. So that's kind of the setting in ancient Mesopotamia that was kind of par for the course that was, was normal. It also held true. That was something that happened in ancient Egypt. So there was different, um, gods that they celebrated and they attached those various gods to different cities in Egypt. And so that would be the primary god that was worshipped in each of those respective cities. And so um, one of the Egyptian kings, Akhenaten, who is like 1350 BC, he wanted to change the worship of his new deity. Um, I think it was like one of the sun gods, Aten, or something like that. But basically he built an entirely new city with temple complexes and everything. Um, And he named the city Akhenaten, which means the horizon of Aten. So like even in the context of that Egyptian king, when he himself like changed over to a new god he he didn't even do it in the city that he was in he built an entirely new city because that's how embedded the deities were in each of the cities and and um that's kind of the culture and what was going on in the world at the time that this was written and so one of the things that we see over and over in the psalms is both an incorporation and an understanding of the history and the culture of what was going on around the time that these were written, but also how Yahweh is set apart and he is far above any and all other false gods at the time. And so from the time that the nation of Israel was founded, Yahweh's intention, God's intention was to establish a holy city where he would dwell. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 12. And so there was various temporary locations, but eventually Jerusalem was that chosen city. And that's where David planned. And then later Solomon built the permanent temple. And so the temple and the city that the temple was located in theologically became the center of the created world. And it was the center of worship for the Israelites, the ancient Israelites. So because there was a close link between city, temple, and deity, there were hymns that were composed in the ancient world that would exalt that city as a beautiful dwelling place or just praise it for... Um, maybe the temple or the god or the goddess that was there. And many of the themes that were found in those hymns are similar to some of the themes that we see in what uh, scripture says are the songs of Zion. So the songs of Zion is a classification of hymns. They they are, we haven't hit some of them yet, but they're um, Psalm 137, Psalm 46, Psalm 48, Psalm 84, Psalm 87, and Psalm 122. And so what they show us in these quote unquote songs of Zion, which are the city hymns, the the hymns that are talking about the city of Zion. Zion was a city that the temple was in. The city and its temple is the dwelling place of God. And so it talks about the grandeur of the location. It talks about the gates. It talks about the walls, the foundation in the city um, is sometimes referred to as being in heaven. It's, it's, describing a place of security. It's talking about the blessing of the people that live there. Maybe there's um, prayer or blessing said over the city. And there's also like Psalm 74 is a city lament. 
And then there is a sacred space psalm in Psalm 84. So we will talk about those more when we get there. But I wanted to just kind of talk about the hymns to the holy cities to help you understand kind of what was going on. Because I think that's different. We don't really, I don't know of any, maybe in some other cultures, but I don't really know um, of many cities even now that do that. The only thing I could kind of liken it to is my husband's family is from Buffalo And so, of course, they are Buffalo Bills fans, but there's a whole like subculture. And this is like a very it's it's a modern day analogy. It's not even doing it justice. So don't come after me. But there's a whole culture of Buffalo Bills fans that have almost like I don't want to say worship, but there's almost like um, a common understanding, a commonality between people that live around Buffalo because they were all all Bills fans. And, you know, we're, we're from Pennsylvania. So we see that with the Pittsburgh Steelers, probably wherever you're at, you, you understand that. And so you, you know, some of those teams, they have their own songs or their, you know, the Pittsburgh has the terrible towel. There's, you know, um, different merchandise that, that are, and colors that, that surround it. It's almost similar to that. That's the only thing I can think of in our modern day culture. And so if Buffalo, if the Buffalo Bills were like the deity of Buffalo, that's kind of what I'm, I'm maybe picturing something for us to kind of understand what was going on. This is much, much, much more important because of course we're talking, especially in, in uh, Christianity, we're talking about God's dwelling place, but it's kind of uh, similar in the sense that there were certain de- cities that were dedicated to certain gods. If you, maybe that helps you understand a little bit. If not, and I confused you further, I'm sorry. And so I want to go through a couple things that I want to point out that I think might be helpful. 48 verse 1, the city of our God. So the city of our God and the great king that it talks about is Jerusalem. And it talks about um, how it will be established forever. So what we're seeing is what God began in the Old Testament he will complete in the new Jerusalem at the end of time as we know it, which is what's talked about in Revelation at the end of the New Testament. And so um, the city of Jerusalem is this place where God's dwelling is and will remain. And eventually that will become complete. So this is the foreshadowing back in the Psalms all the way through to the end of Revelation, but it's talking through the end of time. The holy mountain, so the the book of Psalms repeatedly refers to Mount Zion as the holy mountain, and it's Yahweh's, essentially, sometimes you hear it called the holy hill. It should, and hopefully it's, um, I can do a good job of explaining this, it should be understood that this place is really talking about the importance and the sanctity of because of God's presence, not because it was a special place. And so it's a holy hill, not because the hill itself is holy, but it's a holy hill because that's where God is dwelling. And so there are other, in that culture, there would have been other sacred mountains associated with other gods in other places in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, Like Baal, which was one of the false gods that was worshipped outside of Israel, Baal would have been associated with Mount Zaphon and Marduk with other, uh, actually artificial mountains. And then we talked in depth before about the ziggurat temples in ancient Mesopotamia, where it was like by artificial mountain, it, it was a, what I mean by that is they created a temple that kind of looked like a mountain. And, and that was a place for their, you know, deity to dwell. And so, um, Mount Zion is the mountain where the Holy Spirit or God's holy presence is. And so when it talks about the city of our God, that's the site of the temple and Jerusalem was the dwelling place of God. So, um, verses one and two, it, when it talks about the, his holy mountain and the city of our God, it's really not so much focusing on the city or the mountain itself. It's focusing on God's presence. Now, the reason why they chose mountains is in the ancient world, the highest mountains, especially the ones that were up in the north, they were always considered sacred places. 
and they would be appropriate locations to build temples because they saw them as the the point of the earth where um, it has the closest contact with the heavens or where you know the de- they saw the deity as as dwelling and so that's a tradition that you can still see even today um, there's evidence of that different temples on different mountains and um, that's something that I think I, I did not when I was younger, I did not have a good understanding of what is Mount Zion and what is Jerusalem and what is a temple. And, you know, scripture seems to kind of just refer to all of them similarly. But really what it's doing is it's taking a look at what the culture was at the time. And, you know, the one of the things that I love about God is he meets us where we're at. Um, this, this can feel when we study this, it can feel very foreign for us because we are far removed from that time, from that place, from that culture. But when Yahweh made his presence known, he did it in a way that made sense to the culture at the time. And, and God still does that today. I mean, you know, it might be a little bit different how God makes himself known to us today, but the beautiful thing about God is he is a God that is personal and that he, he meets us where we're at. And so I just want us to recognize that, um, because I think sometimes we overlook that because we don't necessarily understand or we don't necessarily recognize what it means to have a temple on a mountain or, or whatever. I, I, I tend to think that there might be a difference if, if God was to set apart a, a special people for himself today and everything started today, I think that perhaps maybe it would, it would look different because we have a God that is personal and, seeks us out where we're at. Um, and then there's a difference with the way that we see God interact with his people and the way that the other people seem to interact with their gods, because we know they're false gods. And, and it's, um, it's actually quite sad. It's, it's helpful to read it because we see this huge difference between this personal God that finds us where we're at and makes himself known to us versus these other gods that were just largely made up and they had no idea how to communicate with them. No, no idea how to please them. And, you know, it was a lot of, um, there's a lot of false worship that really was very, very destructive to those ancient people groups. So anyway, we'll see that a lot, um, in the ancient writings, even outside of Israel, we'll see the text distra- describe, um, like with Baal, Mount Zaphon was described as a beautiful ha- hill. It was called an inheritance. Um, it was called a lovely, mighty mountain. And like when Jeroboam built a temple in northern Israel, when he was trying to rival the temple that was in Jerusalem, he chose the city of Dan because, again, it was located near Mount Hermon, which was a sacred site left over from the Canaanites. And um, there's like this mountainous region, even the Hittites who, who lived there uh, in what is now present day Turkey, they would depict their God standing on top of mountains. And so this recognition between um, gods and mountains is a longstanding cultural tradition with the ancient world. So I think that's helpful because that background helps us understand the importance of God's mountain in the Old Testament. And not just in the Psalms. We see God's holy mountain talked about th- throughout the whole Old Testament. It was a prominent location because that was what was expected expected of any deity's dwelling. So the temple being on a prominent hilltop in Jerusalem, it's called Mount Zion. Um, the hilltop in Jerusalem and Mount Zion are the same thing. So I don't know if that's confusing for you. That was confusing for me for a lot of years. Um, but Jerusalem itself was located at a higher elevation than much of the surrounding region. So even in ancient Israel, the location of Jerusalem was higher um, as God's chosen city. It was it was at a higher location. So the Hebrew word translated Zaphon can mean the a direction to the north, which is kind of a parallel to the Baal myth. Um, and we don't know if that was intentional or not. I tend to think it was, but it is almost as if the psalmist here is claiming for Yahweh, the divine right to Baal's inheritance, um, which I think is interesting. 
um, because it is a way to assert that Yahweh is the God above all other gods and essentially saying that everything, the whole earth belongs to, to God, Yahweh. And so there is an association between Yahweh and mountains in other texts. Um, Israel's experience of meeting God, like on Mount Sinai is seen in the Exodus. Um, there is a, a, a reference to Yahweh coming from the mountains in the south in Deuteronomy and Habakkuk. Uh, Yahweh identifies with Mount Tamon in um, Habakkuk chapter 3. And it's evident that there are Hebrew inscriptions that are found at um, the southern part of the desert in, in different trading posts, dating all the way back to like 800 B.C., and um, they really complement this interpretation of Psalm 48 that really just helps us to understand that the psalmist is claiming the supremacy of Yahweh at every sacred space in the ancient world. So again, I feel like that is something that is lost on us culturally that is so relevant when we read through these scriptures that helps us to understand things so much better. Another couple of things that I just want to point out. Um, when it talks about citadels, like in verse three, it talks about a citadel, citadel, the psalmist is associating God's presence in the city with protection. And so a fortified city would have had exterior walls that is kind of like the first line of defense. And then within the walls, the palace and the temple complex would have also been fortified further as another layer of defense in case those initial walls were breached, like in an attack. So the word picture here is that Yahweh himself in his temple is the ultimate defense for the city. And I think that has ramifications for us today, that God is our protector. And and one of the things that we know is the same God of the Old Testament is the same God that we serve in the New Testament and now. And so if God is making himself known in a way that makes sense to the people when this was written, and he is saying that he is the protector, we know that he's also our protector. And I don't know if you're like me. I I put up a lot of walls. I I put up a lot of walls because I've been hurt a lot in my life. And and even if I have like a temporary wall or I let somebody in that first layer of walls, there's certainly a secondary set of walls that are in, you know, surrounding my heart. Because um, after you've been hurt a lot, you just learn to put up walls and, and boundaries. And the thing about I, that I love about this word picture is that it is God that is our defender. That even in, in that sense where we think that we are putting up walls to protect ourselves, he is our defender. And, and I love that picture because as we metaphorically think through what it would mean to put God in the highest place in our lives, you know, that's, that's what this is doing. This is putting the deity at the highest place in their lives because that's the closest place to, to be able to reach the God. But yet we know that God reaches down and he finds us where we're at and he meets us where we're at. And so if I think about what is the highest place in my life, I think for me, it's time. It's, it's time is a commodity. I think for, especially if you have children or if you're working full time or, you know, whatever, whatever it is, um, and some people give their time to hobbies and some people give their time to social media and some people give their time to making money. But for me, I have to recognize that if time is my highest place in my life, I need to give that to God. And so that's my encouragement today. I, I want you to think through what, what could those mountains be in your life? What is the highest, what holds the highest value in your life? Is it money? And if it is, how are you giving your money to God? Is it time, like me? How are you giving your time to God? Is it your career? You know, what is it? And the ultimate lesson, I think, here is that God wants to be in that place. He wants to hold the highest place in your heart and your life and your mind. So given that insight, I'm going to go ahead and read Psalm 48 again. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise in the city of our God, his holy mountain. 
It is beautiful in its loftiness, the joy of the whole earth. Like the utmost heights of Zaphon is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. God is in her citadels. He has shown himself to be her fortress. When the kings join forces, when they advance together, they saw her and were astounded. They fled in terror. Trembling seized them, where pain like that of a woman in labor. You destroy them like ships of Tarshish, shattered by an east wind. As we have heard, so we have seen, in the city of the Lord Almighty, in the city of our God, God makes her secure forever. Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Like your name, O God, your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Mount Zion rejoices. The villages of Judah are glad because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go around her, count her towers, consider well her ramparts, view her citadels, that you may tell of them to the next generation. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even to the end. God, we thank you that you are a God that is not impersonal, but recognizes us where we are at and comes down to meet us where we're at in the midst of this. Lord, help us not to lose sight of how you long to have that space in the highest part of our lives. Lord, would you even right now reveal to us what that is, what that means, how we are to elevate you and honor you in our lives. And God, we thank you that you continually pursue this relationship with us. We thank you that you are the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament and now, and that you are the same, that we can rely on you in a world where so many things do not remain the same, that you remain constant. And that constant is your love for us. God, I thank you and I praise you for everything you're doing in and through this podcast. And I pray that you would continue to meet people where they're at. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Hey friends, I just want to let you know that we have lots of great resources for you in the She Hears shop. So if you are looking for something to do after you finish the She Hears Bible study, or even if you would like a Bible to go along with the Psalm study that we're doing, we have lots of note-taking Bibles and journaling Bibles. There's kind of something for everyone in there. And a new thing we put in the shop is something I love. I use it with my teenage daughters, is the Real Pretty Bible books of the Bible markers. So you, they're little tabs you put on the outside of your Bible and they help you easily be able to see and flip to different books of the Bible. It's so helpful like for church or when you're doing a Bible study to easily be able to see where you're going. So I pray all those things are resources that you will find helpful. And again, you can find those at shehears.org on the resources page. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His.